we're going to be looking at one verse today, and that's the first one. The message is follow the leader. All right, Father, help us to remain focused on your word today. Help me to get through the message. Help me to be able to uh, convey what you have uh, given me from study this week. And I pray that you would help us to leave here knowing that we have been with Jesus today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at that first verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 1 says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Do you remember the old game, Follow the Leader? When we had uh, the leader, the idea behind it is to follow the leader or to mimic or copy what the leader does. So I tried to get some illustrations or some examples of what that might look like. You know, we have the leader may go right, the line would go right, the leader may walk with a silly walk, and the rest of them would walk with a silly walk. Uh, you know, basically, everybody's going to do what everybody is supposed to do, except for that one guy at the end who does something crazy, all right? So I, I, was, uh, we, I found some footage from last year's men's retreat uh, that we were able to follow to the, the we're going to go miniature golfing, I think, where we we're going to follow there. Anyway, uh, some of those things. But, uh, you know, it, it's a child's game. It's one of those things. And so, you know, what we know of this is like this. When we think about following the leader, it is something that we watch someone and we follow what they do. We get that. It's a game. But it's more than just a game. We also follow the leader as we get older, don't we? There are, there are people that we follow uh, there are people that we're impressed by, and so we try to do what they do. We, we have a world, uh, you've heard of these influencers out there on social media that are trying to get you to do what they do. You know, crazy things like hanging out the side of a car or walking as the car is driving by itself and they're walking crazily. And, and uh, the funny one that I saw a couple weeks ago is this guy shut his door uh, and he forgot that he had locked the door and he was out there doing this crazy stuff, and he's trying to get into his car, and it won't open because his door is locked. It's like, <laughs> yeah. So don't follow that example. Anyway, an author shared an example of leadership from a field marshal in the U.S. Military Academy. He spoke to eager young soldiers, reminding them that when things are bad, there is going to come a point when everyone will stop and look at the leader. They will be silent in the exhaustion and their worry, but they will fix their eyes on their leader waiting for his command. Their courage may be ebbing away, and their, and their leader must make it flow back to them. Michael McCoby wrote uh, in the Harvard Business Review, for leaders to lead, they need not only to have exceptional talent, but also the ability to attract followers. He says, re regrettably, it's hard to get people to follow. So that's why we have to have dogs. They follow. They do what you do. Isn't that funny? So we could watch that for hours, but I'll, I won't. Today, we're looking at a text in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where the Apostle Paul challenges the believers to follow him. Robert Gramacki wrote, in his commentary, he says it's not wrong to follow a man. We could maybe gender that into a person if that man is following Christ. So it's important for us to have our eyes on the right prize, right? We don't just follow blindly someone. We want to follow someone that's following the Lord, to have a godly influence in our life. J. Oswald Sanders uh, taught us the difference between a natural leader and a spiritual leader. He says, a natural leader is self-confident. It's a key to a leader, right? But a spiritual leader is confident in God. A natural leader, he says, knows men. A spiritual leader knows God. A natural leader makes decisions. And a spiritual leader would seek the will of God. A natural leader is ambitious. And a natural or a spiritual leader would be humble. A natural leader originates his methods. 
Look at the plan that I've made. And a spiritual leader finds and follows God's methods. He goes on through several more examples in his book, but he concluded with this thought. The real qualities of leadership are to be found in those who are willing to suffer for the sake of objectives great enough to demand their wholehearted obedience. So if you want a leader, he's not just going to lead you when there's good times, but he's going to be able to help you focus when times are not so good. In a Christian life, is a life of following the Lord. And we need to have our eyes on him, don't we? Our leader is the Lord. Here, the Apostle Paul is pointing to himself as one to be followed. But today, we want to challenge you to not only consider getting in line and following the Lord, but also be challenged to lead a line of people that, you can fo- that they can follow you because you are following the Lord. It's a simple outline this morning. First of all, the leader is required, uh, requires a leader to follow, and Paul says, follow me, imitate me. That was his first two words. And who is someone that would follow? Well, there's some suggestions that we read in Luke chapter 9. If you want to just put your hand in 1 Corinthians 11 or a bulletin or something, and then follow me over to Luke chapter 9. I've just got a couple of verses I'd like you to to see in this passage. We're looking at verse 57. This is about discipleship. In verse 57, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. This is the impulsive volunteer, maybe, follow you. God, I'll go wherever you want to go. I'll go wherever you go. Now, that sounds very spiritual. It sounds like it's something that we would really want to do. If it's the Lord, obviously, wherever he would go, we would want to go, right? Well, remember, Jesus went to the cross, right? Jesus has some very, very terrifying moments in his life. And I don't know if you paid attention, but toward the end of Jesus' life, there weren't too many followers around the cross, were there? There were a lot of followers while he was doing good and things that he was able to provide for them along the way. But when things kind of got sticky, (laughs) kind of, right? Less followers, right? In fact, uh, it tells us in the the text uh, later on in, in all of the gospel accounts that many, all of them forsook him and fled. Really, only one person at the cross was John. And that's kind of sad. Out of all the followers that Jesus had, we have this person, however, that says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. What was Jesus' response in verse 58? Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, you're going to follow me wherever I go. I don't have a home I'm going to be a lot of places. You're going, your commitment has got to be pretty high. You get what he's saying? That you're, if you're going to follow me, I, I don't really have an itinerary. I'm going to be here today, and I'm going to be there tomorrow. I'm going to be over here. I'm, I'm just going where my father tells me. I'm going where the need is. You could be everywhere and all, at all times, right? The Lord desires that we want to sign, that, that we sign up and follow him. He really wants that to happen. But he also wants us to know what we're getting into. Aren't you happy about that? God wants you to know that the, the rigors are going to be tough, that you're going to be having to have some commitment in your life. And the question I think he's asking without saying it is, if you're following on a whim, are you really sure you want to follow me, right? Are you really sure you want to have that commitment to follow me wherever, wherever you go? And I think that that is something we do really think about. Our following the Lord should not be something that's impulsive, right? And Paul is saying that this was an example that someone would follow Paul impulsively. The other one is a reluctant volunteer. He says in verse 59, then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. 
Now, the Lord is not upset with someone who has a family emergency. Uh, the, the statement that he's saying in verse 60 seems like a little bit uh, that he's not really understanding the, the moment. He says, let the dead bury their own dead, which is kind of hard. You know, the dead really can't do a whole lot. Right? The last I checked, anyway. Unless you're into zombie stuff, and that isn't real. He says, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now, what is Jesus saying here? He's not saying that you can't take a moment and have a family gathering and cel- you know, celebrate their life and bury your father. That's not what he's getting at. But what he's saying is that I will sign up this person says, but there's many things that I need to attend to before I can really go. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to go with you, but let me first do this. And this, this list could be a long list. It can't be just the burying of the dead. There's all kinds of stuff, you know, that there are many things that I've got to do before I can really fully follow you. So following Christ would have to wait until I'm ready to follow. And isn't that the point? When you're ready to follow, you're going to follow. But if there's all kinds of stuff going on in your world right now, you know, if you say, I'm going to follow you, Lord, but first let me do this or let me do that. That's why Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. In other words, if you're going to go and take care of that, there's probably going to be other things that are going to be on your plate too. And eventually you'll get around to following the Lord. We want to be set, you know, Set in our mind, if we're going to follow the Lord, it's going to be one of those things that we're not just going to try it for a little while. And that's kind of the next one, the half-hearted volunteer. That would be the person that would follow. And another one in verse 61 says, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus is saying to them, you know, if you first have to say goodbye to everybody, you know, I don't know if this is, just Jesus' way of saying, I've seen a lot of this already in my life, and I know that there are people who are committed to follow me, and then there are others who want to follow me, but there's all these other things going on in their world or things that they've got to take care of or things that I've got to finalize before I can actually do that. This half-hearted person, his heart really is back at home. I'm going to serve you, Lord, but I've got to make, I've got to make my goodbyes, and then you know what's going to happen. This has happened, I've seen this in ministry, there's young people who are really called to, by the Lord to go, maybe we had a, a gal in our, our church back in Iowa who wanted to go serve the Lord in the mission field, and her parents literally talked her out of it. We're going to miss you. That'll be so hard. You won't be around for the family stuff. You know, if your sister gets married or whatever, there were a litany of reasons why that person shouldn't follow the Lord to the mission field. And her parents literally talked her out of it. And I think that is what Jesus is getting at. When I go and say goodbye to my family, and if I don't have a supportive family that's saying, you should go and follow the Lord, they're going to find every reason under the sun for you to stay home. And I think that's where the commitment level has to take over. If we're going to follow the Lord, if we're going to imitate him, we've got to do it wholeheartedly. Paul wanted those to follow him to do just that, to follow him. Now, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, I don't think that he was one that would say, okay, I'll wait here for a minute. You go up there and take care of that. I'll wait around for you. Paul's like, I'm going to be like 30 miles down the road. If you want to wait, you know, I'm not going to wait for you. If you want to do that, fine, but you're going to have to hustle to the next stop. I, I think Paul the Apostle was a driven man. He was one who was literally following the Lord. I'm going to do what God wanted me to do and go and do it. The Apostle Paul had a strong commitment to whatever he was doing. Remember before he was saved, he had a strong commitment to going and getting Christians to bring them back to persecute. He was very, a strong personality. And God used that as he was following the Lord. But he was teaching those who followed him to have that same kind of commitment. Remember what he told to Timothy when he was uh, telling him about the things of, uh, of commitment? He says, be an example to the believers as Paul was teaching those who he was faithful to and, and convinced, convinced that I've got I've to teach them commitment, he's telling them that I want you to be an example to the believers. If you're going to follow the Lord, follow him with all your heart. 
Several times Paul pointed to himself as an example to follow in Scripture. In fact, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, he tells us in this passage that Paul is a pattern of good works. Boy, that's bold, isn't it? That's kind of bold to be able to put that out there. If you follow me, uh, I'm a pattern of good works. I've fallen a few times in my, in my life. How about you? And if I'm saying, watch me, don't watch that part of me. <laughs> watch me, though, because I'm following Christ. There's a commitment that Paul had to watch his P's and Q's, to make sure that every I was dotted, every T was crossed as he followed the Lord. Was Paul perfect? No. Paul made mistakes just like you and I. But Paul's commitment to following Christ superseded some of the things that he did that would pale in comparison to his following the Lord. And that's why he could boldly say in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16, imitate me. He says that again in chapter 11, doesn't he? In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, Paul said, join me in following my example. Join in following my example. And then I also want you to note those other people that are following the Lord as well. Maybe there are people around you that are following the Lord. You don't have to just look at the pastor. You don't have to just look at, at leaders in the church. You can look at one another and follow. If they're following the Lord, it's okay. We follow people as long as they're following the Lord, right? And that's in, in, so essential for us to understand because in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul was teaching Timothy, he says, listen, the things that you see in me, you do. Follow my example. But he also went a step further. Teach others also. Teach this to faithful men so that they will also uh, teach others to teach others to teach others. So our work is really generational, isn't it? not just me living for the Lord. I'm hoping that I pass information along to my children who are serving the Lord. And I'm praying that their children will watch the example of their parents and that they will also follow the Lord. And I'm praying that they will then one day have children that they can teach to follow the Lord. You see how that wonderfully works? Now, there are times when a Christian couple has a child a son or a daughter who is who's just not interested in following the things of the Lord. What do you do? Well, first and foremost, you pray. You pray and ask God to help them catch what you've taught. And if you've made a mess of your of your leadership in your home, pray and ask God to forgive you. And then you go to your children and you tell them, I I messed up. Would you please forgive me? And I want you to follow the Lord instead of following my example, which was poor. I mean, we have to be honest at some points in our life, don't we? So we want to be what God wants us to be. Now, there are times that no matter how committed we might be, that we find ourselves in a, in a little bit of a snip because we wonder what in the world happened. The disciples of Jesus give us an example while we're here in Luke chapter 9. Uh, even though they had Jesus right there with him, in fact, the chapter... Uh, right in the middle of the chapter, Peter, James, and John go to the Mount of Transfiguration. We read that earlier in the 27th verse. And they see the glory of God unveiled. What a beautiful sight that had to be. And when they return back down off the mountain, uh, we find them in verse 41 <coughs> in a situation where um, they were faced with a difficult situation uh, delivering a young boy from a demon. And it, we read how this, this boy, was, they weren't able to do it. And the dad actually went and sought for Jesus to come and help them because they, he couldn't, they couldn't do it. What were the reasons they were unable to deliver this boy from the demon? Well, in verse 41, we read that, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you bring your son here. They couldn't do it because they had lacked the faith. Jesus says, faithless and perverse generation. You were, didn't have enough faith to believe that what God had given you to do. Now, Jesus rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. We can't do the works of Christ without faith in God, can we? If we're doing the works of God on our own, we're going to fail. Eventually, we're going to fall on our face, and that's kind of what happened here. 
So, oh, yeah, bring him over here. We'll do what we do. And it didn't happen the way they wanted it to do. So we read in a companion passage to Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. It was really a, a lack of the essentials that Jesus in, gifted them with. He told them the disciples were unable to do this because they needed to do this with fasting and prayer. In other words, they had to pray and ask God to help them, and they had to cleanse their life from just making it a focus on this. It wasn't just something, well, I'm going to go do this, and it's easy. I'll take care of it. We can't do the works of God without following the essential example of Christ, without fasting and prayer, he said. In, a look, in verse 46, it was because they had maybe a lack of humility. Right after this event, I mean, here it is, that there was a, a dispute arose among them as to which one of them would be the greatest. Well, I think following that example, none of them were great, <laughs> right? I mean, none of them could do what the works of God that he had gifted them to do. Now, we know that God gave them the power to do these things. He en en enriched them with these gifts, but they were unable to deliver. And part of the reason was because they weren't following the example set forth before God, that, that he set before them. Now, God places people in our lives which offer us a great example to follow. So remember, if that person is following Christ, you can follow that person. But if that person is, is wayward, then maybe we need to follow, a, find a way that we can point them into the right direction and get them back on track. Amen? Paul not only offered himself as an example, but he also encouraged these people to follow Christ. He goes, listen, I want you to follow me in verse 1 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. He says, I want you to imitate me. But he says, I want to set the parameters of you following me just as I follow Christ. So it wasn't just, everything and anything that he would do. I think in our day and age, if we were to be confused about anything, we would tell people, hey, you should follow me, you know, follow this leader. I, I, was, I was going to do some research uh, about ministry failures, and I just got discouraged, and I, I just got off of that one. Forget it. The people, listen, people are going to fail you at every turn. Just count on that. And if you find somebody that you can follow that hasn't failed yet, then count that as a blessing, right? It's a bonus. But people fail. The apostle finished the verse by telling the believers that instead of always looking at me, I want you to focus, turn your attention to, look at Christ. Follow him. I'm trying to follow the Lord. I'm trying to do the right thing, Paul is saying, but I really want you to look at the Lord, how he is empowering me to do the right things. I'm going to fail you. I'm going to fall at some point in your life, and you're going to say, oh, right? Frustration. Why couldn't they do the right thing all the time? Are you doing the right thing all the time? Have you ever had your child look at you and say, what did you just do, daddy? <laughs> what did you just do, mommy? It's like, uh, don't look at that right? We will all fail. But there is a hymn that I remember uh, singing years back. It was, earthly friends may prove untrue, doubts and fears assail. One still loves and cares for you, one who will not fail. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus never fails. In the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, we find these Corinthian Christians that were pointing out in their carnality that they were living lives that they placed way too much emphasis on following a human leader. They were saying, I'm of a Paul, or I'm of Apollos. And of course, there was a group of them were saying, with their thumbs under their collective suspenders, well, I'm of Christ. You know, we've always got someone in there that's following a person. We should be following the Lord. Putting our eyes on man may cause us to be disappointed. Don't be disappointed with your human leader. Pray for that human leader, that he would be following Christ, 
that he would be doing the right things, that he would be following what the Bible tells us. Now, what would make one follow Christ? What would be the, the encouragement or the, the, uh, the benefit to following Christ? Why should we do that? Well, I think number one, first and foremost, is because he's Lord, amen? I mean, that should be the end of the argument. <laughs> we shouldn't really have to share with you any other passages of Scripture that say, you should follow the Lord because, but I'm going to anyway. So why follow Christ? I, I just put this out here quickly so we can look at it. He is the creator. You know, if there's no other reason that you should follow the Lord, it's because he made you. You should follow the Lord because he made you. John 1, 1 through 3, he's the creator. He's the word that was from the beginning. He's the son of God. I mean, he is, Jesus is the son of God. Why, wouldn't, why would we not want to follow him, right? John 1, 14, uh, the, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of God through him. So we, are, we have a good reason to be following the Lord. Uh, he is the savior. In 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, Peter writes uh, these verses to kind of encourage us that we keep our eyes on the Lord and we follow his example. Listen to this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. How are we saved? Not by corruptible things, in verse 18, silver and gold, uh, by the traditions of your father, but he says, with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, Jesus became our savior because he died on the cross for our sins and offered Salvation to people who would believe by faith. We also know that he's alive forevermore, amen? Uh, we read that in the 21st verse, that it says that who through him, Jesus, believe in God, who was raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God for following him because he is God, but he raised him up and he's alive forevermore. Do you know that the Savior is also returning for us? Jesus is coming back. We should be following him because you never know when he's going to come around the corner. There he is. Ooh, don't be surprised. And we need to be ready for the Lord to come. Amen? We need to be on guard, but ready for his return. John 14, 6, he goes, I go to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come again, and I'll receive you to myself, that where I am, you will be also. What a beautiful privilege that we have to be able to see Jesus face to face but he is also an example that we should follow. In uh, John 13, verse 15, the Bible tells us that Jesus is an example given to us to follow. He gave, God was given, or Jesus was given to us so that we could follow his example. He was on earth so people could actually look at him. He says in verse 15, Jesus says this, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, in this reference, it was he was washing the feet of the disciples, showing his humility, but an example to follow. There's so many things that we can look in our world and say, you know, do you remember, remember back when Michael Jordan was playing basketball? You remember this phrase that everybody said, be like Mike, right? Now, there's some things that Mike did that weren't such good things to do. Example to follow, for instance. You know, if we're going to put our eyes on people, we've got to understand that people will fail you. But our eyes really ought to be focused on, shouldn't we be more like Jesus? I mean, really, shouldn't that be our goal? And, you know, I mean, God has given us earthly examples, people around us that we could be like. We want to be like my dad, or I want to be like my mom, or maybe there's an uncle or somebody like that. I want to be more like my sister or my brother or something like that. We have physical people on the earth that we can look at and maybe aim to, to be like them. But, you know, there's only so, so many traits or qualities that they have that we can really truly follow. There's some of them. I remember uh, my dad telling me about his dad, telling him when he was growing up, don't do as I do, do as I say. Because there were some traits in grandpa that he didn't want anybody else to follow, and, uh, and I, frankly, they, he was right. Don't follow what grandpa did, because there were things that he did that no one should do. But there are some qualities that we could find in people, but listen, the statement is, if people are following Christ, we can follow them. But our eyes ought to be on Christ. Following Christ should not be impulsive, should it? It's not something we just say, 
hey, let's try this for a little while. You know, it, it shouldn't be done for a short term either. Following Christ should not be done something like, I'll, I'll try it for a, a, we had a guy on our camp board back in Iowa that always said, let's try it for a year. That was, his, that was his statement every board meeting we'd have. We'd have something that we're trying to decide to do, and he goes, well, let's just try it for a year. We want to do this not just for a short-term basis, but if we're going to follow the Lord, we need to get on ba- and board and, and ride the horse. Amen? Get it done so that we can do this with true commitment in our heart. After reading Luke 9 and verse 62, Jesus reminded that last half-hearted follower, he says, listen, no one having put his hand on the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now today, that, that verse would confuse the farmer because they have GPS farming. You know, they don't literally, they don't even have to grab a hold of the wheel. I think now, I don't even know if they have to turn the wheel at the end of the row. Uh, it used to be where the row you could drive straight through with the GPS and you'd have to run it around the corner and then line it up and the GPS would take it over. I'm not so sure now that they've got it so that they know the end of the field, the tractor to mistake the turn. I, I see farmers that are taking books into their tractors now and they're just reading. That'd be a great time to catch up on some of your Bible reading while you're planting and harvesting, right? So the old timer, they would have the plow hooked up to the oxen and they would put their hand on the plow and then the farmer would look at something distant and they would keep their eye on that thing, that point. And then the, straight, the row would be straight. You know, what the worst thing uh, is that a farmer would be grabbing a hold of the plow and going, hey, right? And then he'd look over here, there's a bee and it's like, <laughs> the rows aren't so straight. So you can't be unfocused when you're trying to run the plow. That was the point. And Jesus wanted them, when they put their hand on the plow, to remain committed to what's in front of them. You know, we have an enemy, right? We all know that. Satan's our enemy. But you know that he's defeated. You know that? Satan has not won the battle. He's lost the war. Now, he may get you once in a while, but you need to claim the power of Christ when you're going through life, that he can frustrate you and discourage you and all kinds of things, but you keep your eyes on the Lord, you will make it to the end of the road. We need to trust the Lord. We need to follow Christ fully. Take up your cross and follow him. We need to follow Christ consistently. Give of your best to the master. And we need to follow Christ openly. And now, now is the time for us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. People in our world need Jesus, and we need to be telling them. I wonder, are you ready to get in line and follow Christ? Maybe, maybe there's people in your world that you can actually lead. If you're following the Lord, you can also lead them, couldn't you? It's important for us to follow the leader, and that's what we want to do today. Father, help us to have a mindset that has commitment. Not just try it for a little while, not because it's popular, not because we've got nothing else better to do, but because we've put our heart into it and we're following you, Lord, because we know the value of it. I pray you would help us to be committed Christians that would, once we put our hand on the plow, that we would not look back. We would not stop following you, but we would be committed to your cause. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a stanza of an old hymn, Footprints of Jesus. Stand with me, if you would, please, as we close this portion. Remind you that... uh,